That's right. What I was, yeah, that. But also what I was going to say is I'll speak briefly uh, and then what I will do is take some questions from you guys. Uh, but I thought, what is it that I could say uh, to a group like this that might be useful? I was asked to tell my story. I hate telling my story. Uh, but I thought, you know, why not? Why not give some advice? And uh, somebody's gone before me in the advice-making stakes, and he did very, very well at it, so I've somewhat plagiarised his methodology. And so my talk tonight is called Eight Rules for Life. Um, and uh, I don't have 12, I have less, so I think I'm smarter for that. Uh, but also, the author of my rules is not Jordan Peterson. The author for my rules, or actually it's a quite, quite slight perversion of what the author originally said, but the author is Jesus. And I have eight rules for life, each one of them is based on a beatitude uh, from Matthew chapter 5. And uh, the first rule really uh, sets the tone for something quite different. Uh, I think I could guarantee that if you had invited uh, your average celebrity uh, or a guru or a motivational speaker or somebody from the cultural elite of Australia or the West in general, and they were to come in here and they were to give you a motivational talk or they were to inspire you with something, they would start on a very positive note. Uh, I think they would probably start by telling you something that had a particular flavour to it. Uh, and it's a flavour that I call the flavour of self. And you can be sure that they will tell you that there's something about you that's wonderful. There's something about you that's worthy of self-esteem. There's something about you that's, you know, self-worth. Your identity is worth discovering and drawing out and you should be vulnerable to open yourself up so that other people can see who you really are and just marvel at how great it is, you know. I saw a billboard outside the Canberra airport just this afternoon as I drove past and it says, master the artistry of you. And I thought, what a pile of claptrap. Um, do you know this is the time of loving yourself? It's a time of me time or I heard in a church the other day, can you believe it? You do you because no one does you better than you. And I thought, what the heck does that mean? Uh, and there's no limits. You can be anything. You can do anything. You can become whatever is within the quant quantum of your dreams to become. You know, follow your dreams. And I would say, well, Hitler followed his dreams. Um, he did a great job at it, actually, for quite a long time. Um, what's the problem? Of course, the problem is, actually, that's a false set of ideas to look within yourself, and that's so much the spirit of our age. Do you know the first rule for life is countercultural, it is don't love yourself. I actually nearly said you're not beautiful, but I thought that might be a bit tough. Um, because of course you are beautiful, you know, don't let anyone tell you otherwise, you're amazing! That's completely the culture of our times. Um, Jesus starts in the Beatitudes with blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who actually are not self-satisfied. Blessed are those actually who are emptied of self, who have a more critical view of self, who have a lower view of self. Strange, isn't it, when we're so conditioned for so many decades now to think in the paradigm of self-esteem, that he would start with this. You know, I, there's a frame in my parents' home uh, with this beautiful uh, stitched sort of tapestry with all the Beatitudes listed and you read them and they roll off the tongue with such poetic effect and they're so beautifully written and you know, you think, oh, how nice. And nobody realises that Jesus actually opened by saying, you're not that good. <laughs> you know? And Jesus actually is really tapping into something that God actually is with the person who is not self-satisfied. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does it say in Isaiah? It says, it says, I dwell in the high and holy place I'm the one whose name is holy, who inhabits eternity, and I dwell with him who is of a humble and a contrite spirit. So don't love yourself. But it gets worse, because the second rule for life is because there's nothing to love. Um, the other countercultural thing that Jesus said was that out of the heart of man flows evil thoughts, covetousness, wickedness, lustful intent, malice, pride, Envy, and I can't remember the rest, but it goes on for a while. And he says, and this defiles a person. Do you know, I often say to people, I'm a Protestant, so forgive me referring to the Bible all the time. I'll try and, I'll make one reference to Augustine, so it'll be okay. Um, <laughs> in the Bible, I always say, it's interesting, the human race gets one compliment. One. Right at the start. 
made in the image and likeness of God. It's a great compliment, don't get me wrong. But man, we kind of love it, don't we? Always banging on, Imago Dei, Imago Dei, image of God, it comes up all the time. I'm like, have you read the rest? Because you turn the page, there's something called a fall, and then there's not a single compliment right through to the end. And in fact, every single page has negative feedback, does it not? You know, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I will skip that bit, not good for self-esteem. Next one, you know, your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Okay, next one, you've got a reprobate mind. What does that mean? Next one, you know, you're walking after the prince of the power of the air. Satan is your mind. Oh, next one. And so you go through. Dead in trespasses and sins. Oh, next one. And so it goes on. Every single page, negative feedback. Isn't it interesting? I think that one of the things about our time is that particularly our generation, particularly millennials, just don't have a very healthy understanding of actually how needy we are and how evil we are. We don't have a good sense of our own faults. We don't have a good sense of our own sinfulness. We don't have a good sense of our own fallenness. And that's the second rule for life because Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn and in the context, you know, it's got to be a character trait. Poor in spirit's a character trait. Hungry and thirsty for righteousness is a character trait. Peacemakers, that's a character trait. They're all character traits. You know, what would be such a good character about mourning? Well, it comes after being self-empty. Why would you be mourning over self-emptiness? Well, because you know who you really are. And that's actually what Jesus cried about. That's what he mourned over. He mourned over sinfulness in the world. This is what Paul mourned over, you know. He put, mourned over his own weakness. He said, who's going to deliver me from this body of flesh? He said, wretched man that I am, mourned over his own sinfulness. It's not something we do very much these days, is it? To actually be sorry about our own weaknesses, sorry about the contents of our own hearts. So don't love yourself because there's nothing to love. (laughs) Sorry. Um, Countercultural message right here. But you know, it's a healthy thing to face that. It's a healthy thing. Like I said before, I was kind of joking, but kind of not when I said Hitler followed his dreams. The problem is that what's within is not actually that good. What's if we are bound, we have raised a generation of young people to look within themselves, to worship and serve the identity, the true self. Psychological theories of our time really pursue that line. The education systems of our time pursue that line, to, to esteem that which is you and that psychological health and happiness. Do you know, it doesn't take that much genius to think, well, of course that's going to breed narcissism. Of course that's going to breed uh, uh, people who are full of themselves. That's an insult for a reason. Of course that's going to breed people who have no need of outside input. You know, haters going to hate. Well, actually, it's good feedback. You should probably listen from time to time. <laughs> You know, no, people who are immune to the character building effects of transcendent good that is outside of themselves. Which brings me to the third rule for life, which is, so therefore look up, not in. Look up, not in. Because Jesus says, blessed are the meek. What's a meek person? The Bible says that Moses was the meekest man on all the earth. And the thing about Moses was, he was very meek, but gosh, he did some amazing things. Mighty military general, somebody who had all these people under his charge, somebody who had, man, he had guts, went to uh, Pharaoh who could have just killed him like that because he didn't like the shape of his nose. Uh, This guy was a tyrant, a maniac, and Moses did amazing things, a man of tremendous strength, but the secret of his strength was not himself. God called Moses to go to Pharaoh, and Moses said, I can't do it. I can't do it. And the answer comes, but I will go with you. And it's like in the Psalms, you'll read the Psalmist open, and this is David, of course, a king. He says, I lift my eyes to the hills, where does my strength come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And a meek person is actually a person who is in humility, imbibing strength from outside of themselves. Do you know, there's nothing more important than recognizing that the transcend that, that all that is good, true, beautiful is transcendent, outside of me, above me, to be embodied, to be reached, to be sought, to be understood, to shape me and mold me and change me. 
doesn't come naturally from within, it comes from outside. So look up, not in. Fourth rule for life is check your appetite. Because the next beatitude is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And of course, if you're no longer full of yourself, which you should not be, of course, if you have got a realistic view of yourself and all the faults and failings and shocking things that can come out of the heart of man, you know, we always blame the phobias and the isms and the patriarchies and the politics and the culture and society uh, teaches us these things. What's society? It's seven billion of you. That's the problem. And we don't have a healthy sense of that. But you know, if you really start to see that and you start to look outside of yourself, here's a really good point. Check your appetite. Because appetites don't go unsatisfied for long. I remember I was doing a talk up in Brisbane a little while ago in the city and there was a, a big church there and I was sitting up the front and I was going to get up and talk and I must have been about three minutes away from my talk and I had a dizzy spell. And then it hit me, I hadn't eaten for 36 hours. Because uh, I just had, this happens, you, know, you just get a busy spell and you're getting on planes and you're running here and you're running there and you haven't eaten, you're about to pass out. And I thought, what am I going to do? I can't get up there and talk for half an hour. Uh, and so I got out of my seat, all mic'd up and ran out the door. Um, and I ran down to the corner store uh, and I bought a Red Bull and a muesli bar, chucked them both in, went back up, did my talk and had a proper meal later, don't worry. Um, but everybody in the place probably thought that I was stage frighting and they'd lost me. And I walked in just in time to get up and speak. And see, appetites make themselves known and they must be satisfied. Good question, isn't it? What are you hungry for? Hungry for righteousness. Hungry for that which is good, that which is right, that which is true. Hungry for character, hungry for Christ. Hungry for what God has outside of you, for you, to be imbibed. Check your appetite. Number five, do unto others what Christ has done for you. Why do I say that? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And you know, if you are this person, if you are looking up, not in, if you're not loving yourself, if actually you are seeking strength from outside of yourself, actually you have a healthy understanding of who you are and you think, wow, God has dealt with me with such mercy because He didn't give me what I deserved and He doesn't give me what I deserve. Psalm says, you haven't dealt with me after my sins or according to my iniquities, but as high as the heavens are above the earth, so, high is your mercy, so great is your mercy towards those who fear you. I think that's remarkable. What, of all the characteristics of God that Jesus could have put in this beatitude, He chose mercy. I think it's probably because it's such an otherworldly characteristic. I've never heard it said in all of my life. I've never heard the compliment given that somebody is merciful. Oh, you know, they're very kind. Uh, you know, they're very smart. Uh, they're very, I even heard once someone described as righteous, which I didn't know if that was a good or a bad thing in the context. Um, but I have never heard anyone describe as, oh, you know, Joe over there, great thing about Joe is he's very merciful. <laughs> never heard it. Why? It's just something that's so uniquely God's. It's remarkable not to deal with someone in accordance with what they deserve. Isn't that how we react to everyone all the time? Of course we deal with people according to what they deserve, based on how they've interacted with us. We react all the time, not God. And you know, when you have a healthy sense of what God's done for you in Christ, in mercy, your attitude to others is changed. You don't treat them how they deserve to be treated. Do unto others as Christ has done for you. That's actually the example of Joseph, remember, with his brothers, and they come back to him after all those years, after selling him into slavery and doing such evil to him doesn't deal with them according to what they deserve. He could have killed them and no one would ever have known. But no, he showed them great mercy and he reconciled with them. Sixth rule, only one thing matters. Blessed are the pure in heart. What's a pure heart? It's a heart that is unmixed in its allegiance. I have a silver coin at home, a Sydney Olympic memorabilia and there's a certificate of authenticity with it that says 99.98% silver. What is that? They got so close. You know, why not point two? Come on! Um, but 100% pure, a pure coin is silver and nothing else. Pure heart, one objective, sold out to one thing. John Anderson, the former Deputy Prime Minister of this country, tells a story how that when he was up in Parliament, he used to have a colleague that would bang on his, his office door every morning of a sitting week and without invitation would just bang, bang, bang and throw it open regardless of the circumstances and he'd yell into the office, Oi John! 
Remember today, you're playing to an audience of one. And he'd shut the door and walk away. Um, and John said, what a fantastic reminder it was for him every day. He's in the eyes of the media. He's in the eyes of his party. He's in the eyes of his constituency. He's in the eyes of his colleagues. He's in the eyes of so many people in politics. You can never get away. You can't walk through an airport or a street without people looking at you. But this guy reminded him, actually one thing matters. An audience of one. Serve God. Serve God alone. It's very hard for us. It's very hard because we can see all of our friends sitting around looking at us. And there's someone's eyes we don't see. But we're supposed to live wholly for that one thing. God's approval. God's eyes. So only one thing matters. The last, be- the last well, I'll do the last two. I was going to skip one, but I better not because there'll be seven rules. Um, I better do eight. Seventh rule, quickly. Jesus says in that last beatitude, he says, um, uh, he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. And so effectively what he's saying is, you know what? These people, they bear their family likeness. They're in God's family. They're God's children. They will be called sons of God. They'll have that genetic likeness because they make peace. And the rule I want to pull out of this is bear your family likeness. Do you belong to God? Do you belong to Christ? Are you a Christian? Just live like it. Show the genetics. There's a reason when people look at a brother and sister, they go, are you brother and sister? There's a likeness here. My dad used to pull me aside as I went out in an evening sometimes when I was in high school. And he'd grab me up and say, now listen, Martin. He'd say, remember the aisle standard. Like this, and give me a very stern look. And <laughs> the aisle standard, what's that? Well, don't disappoint me. You know what our family stands for. It's the same thing. Who do we claim to be? Bear the mark of that, the genetics of it. Bear your family likeness. And finally, rule number eight, suffer well. Back to the negatives. I know, I got got some good ones there, but we're negative again. Number eight, suffer well. Because Jesus finishes by saying, blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you know, we spend a lot of time avoiding suffering. We spend a lot of time avoiding persecution, insult, hardship. We put our head down. We fear the consequences of those things. And Jesus makes a promise. Don't fear. Trust God. Because he says, blessed are the promise is to hype yourself up to such an extent that you might feel blessed. He says, no, you are blessed. It's a fact. So if you do right, if you live these rules, if you embody, if you have the attitude of the Beatitudes, the attitude of the Beatitudes, if you do that, you will suffer. People will hate you because they hate what's good sometimes. No other reason. And he says, suffer well. Trust that promise. And if you trust that promise, And if you're living for an audience of one, actually what will happen is that you will know something of God and taste something of Christ, even in suffering, that you never would otherwise have known. I remember as a kid, I was in a church once and this guy was up at the pulpit and he screamed out and he pointed like this. He said, who told you it was going to be easy? Like this. And his finger rested right on me. I was about seven and I felt like, I don't know. Um, (laughs) But it's true, right? Who told you it was going to be easy? It's not going to be easy. And the world is changing in such a way that actually to live for Christ today is not going to be easy. I tell you what, you'll be so scared sometimes when you have to make a stand that you'll feel sick and you'll shake. But you know, what do they say? Speak truth, even when your voice shakes. And you know what? Everyone might turn around and tell you you're a complete fool. And you might go, my goodness, I'm a complete fool. I tell you what, next time you'll be a bit less of a fool. Just be a little bit better. And then a little bit better, and in five years' time, you won't know who you are. And you've done the right thing, come what may. You've suffered well. And I tell you now, I can tell you this, Jesus' promise is true. You will be blessed, and you will know it, and you'll know it with great reality. Eight rules for life. Don't love yourself, because there's nothing to love. (laughs) So look up, not in. Check your appetite. Do unto others what Christ has done for you. Only one thing matters. Bear your family likeness and suffer well. That's all I have to say. Thank you.